I decided to write Foodopoly to answer some of these mythologies that we have amongst people who are trying to change the food system and because I think we really need to generate a discussion and a debate about the deeper structural issues that are the problem with our food system. So I actually want to start this evening talking about subsidies, which are usually um, not a very, uh, something that people are very interested in, and people usually damn them without thinking a whole lot about it. Now, I'm not here to defend the subsidy system, but I do think that we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, as my mother used to say. So I, I want to tease it out a little bit. Why do we have a subsidy system? What happens if we just end it without changing food policy? And what do we really have to do to change this dysfunctional food system? Well, I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I talk about some farm history and numbers. So let's begin with some statistics. And you know what Mark Twain said about statistics? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And that's surely the case when you look at the US Department of Agriculture's statistics. Now, they claim that today there are 2.2 million farmers. Well, let's look at those numbers. They define a farm as the very smallest farmer having sales of under $1,000 a year. That's a third of farmers. Then, two-thirds of farmers have sales of under $10,000 a year. So who are these people? Well, they're like my good friend down the road who has a vineyard. He sells about probably around $10,000 of grapes a year. He's retired military, has a very good off-farm income, moved to the country to grow grapes because he wanted a vineyard, always dreamed of having a vineyard. He's really not a farmer. Then there's my friend who sells flowers during the summer. She's retired also, has a good off-farm income, and she makes probably eight or nine hundred dollars a year. It's a hobby. She grows beautiful uh, flowers for some of the nice restaurants in town. So because the USDA counts these people as farmers, hobby farmers, very, um, these entities with very small sales, it makes it look like there are a lot more farmers than there actually are. Probably the USDA is doing this because they're embarrassed uh, and ashamed about how few farmers are left. When you actually look at how many farmers work full time on the farm using their labor, it's under a million farmers that we have left. And of those, only 115,000 are the very giant agribusiness farms that probably use contract labor that have thousands of acres that they use uh, to grow commodity crops. So what does this mean? This means when you look at who is getting the subsidies, 82% of full-time farmers get subsidies. And small and mid-sized farmers all get subsidies. And the typical uh, income, the average income, is just over $19,000 of a full-time uh, commodity farmer, just over $19,000. And half of that comes from this government subsidy system. So truly, something is wrong. But what happens if we just get rid of the subsidies and we don't change the structure of the food system before we do that? Because no farmer wants to have to depend on a subsidy system. What happens is already happening. These small and mid-sized farms are going out of business. And what happens then? This 115,000 really giant farms buy or rent the land uh, of these smaller farmers. And it means more and more and more consolidation. 
This isn't what we want for transitioning our food system. We want to save small and mid-sized conventional farms. We want these farms to be part of a new food system. We want to convert these farm, farms in the future to organic production. We want to join with farmers to create a new food system because let's face it, how can we have a new food system without farmers? And I must say that, that here in Seattle, you're very, very, very lucky. In fact, you kind of live in a bubble where you have a, um, a progressive community, you have a, a fairly vibrant small farm community, you have access to lots of different kinds of food, in fact, all up and down the West Coast. But the rest of the country does not enjoy the benefits of Seattle. And don't we want to have a food system that really feeds everyone and that all Americans uh, have the availability of healthy and affordable food? And we want policies that allow people around the world to eat affordable and healthy food and not to have our multinational corporations dictating farm and food policy. So now that we've looked at how poorly farmers are doing income-wise, I want to talk a little bit uh, about why that is. Well, farmers have increasing costs for seed, fuel, equipment, all of the inputs for farming. And in large part, that's because of the consolidation in all of those industries. As you know, almost every industry in the U.S is concentrated in the hands of a few companies. So fuel prices are going up, equipment prices are going up, and seeds. Seeds are a good example of how expensive it is to farm. Since the recession, the price of corn seeds has gone up 34%. Um, percent. The price of soy seeds has gone up 24%. Uh, percent. This year, in 2013, it's estimated that the price of seeds is going to go up 7 to 10 percent. And I'm not just talking about the genetically engineered corn and soy seeds. I mean all seeds are becoming expensive. On my small farm uh, that feeds 500 families, my husband spends about $10,000 a year on seeds, and that's increasing every year. The seed companies have consolidated. Monsanto has absorbed about 60 different seed companies. We have just a couple of seed companies that have grown so big and powerful that they literally control the industry. So that's one of the costs, is that it's just costly to farm. And so any of the price increases that farmers have seen in uh, corn, for instance, um, is being absorbed by the higher cost of farming. So also, farmers have a very consolidated market to sell into. If you're a farmer, and this is true for fruits and vegetables and grains, if you're a grain or a commodity farmer, there's probably only one grain elevator in your town. It's probably controlled by one of the big uh, grain traders, a Cargill or a company like that. And there isn't the infrastructure to sell your crops. In fact, if you wonder why commodity farmers grow commodities, it's because, uh, first of all, they have the, the weather conditions that make it difficult to compete with places like California if, in growing fruits and vegetables. And they have been pushed by USDA farm policy into growing these crops. And there's just not a fair market for these growers. We'll talk a little bit later about what livestock growers face. The same is true in growing produce. It's much, much more difficult for farmers to compete today. Even orchardists, we know, with the global trade agreement. So all of these overarching policies are making it more difficult to be a farmer. So how did we get in this mess? I want to go back and talk a little bit about some farm history. So everybody knows about the New Deal and that uh, the U.S. was in really terrible economic shape. In fact, 
the banks and many of the uh, corporations of those days uh, were using the same uh, bad policies that have brought on the, uh, the economic problems today, the recession and so forth. So when Roosevelt came into office, one of the things that he wanted to do was to help bring up the income of rural people because at that time, 54% of Americans lived in rural areas and most were engaged in farming and farmers were not making a living. They weren't making the cost of production. In part, it was because of things like the Dust Bowl of uh, environmental problems, but it was also because of overproduction. Farmers, when left to their own devices, try to make as much money out of their land and equipment as possible to make a living. So they grow as much as possible on the land that they have. And that means that there are more crops usually than can be absorbed by the marketplace, which lowers the price of crops. It's overproduction. Overproduction is the bane of all types of, of farmers. So what the Roosevelt administration did was they passed a, a farm bill, and it, it was the first farm bill. Uh, and, and since then, every five years or so, a farm bill passes a very large piece of legislation that we'll talk about a little bit later. But it had some programs in to prevent overproduction and to raise the income of farmers to be on par with the rest of society. It was like a minimum wage for farmers. And some of those programs were things like a grain reserve, a set-aside program so that farmers weren't growing on all of the land that they had, especially marginal land. It was a way to stop overproduction. Uh, there was a price floor instituted um, for, for commodities. Now, this worked really well through World War II. Farmers' income was raised, there were enough crops, there wasn't uh, price volatility. But after World War II, there was a, an effort by some of the uh, economic and business leaders in the country to undo this farm policy. And they had a number of reasons for wanting to undo it. And so these men, got together, and they were men at this time. It was people like the president of Studebaker, the head of the Kodak company, an individual who was an expert in uh, the new science of public relations. They put together a, an organization called the Committee for Economic Development. And the goal of this uh, organization was to frame the economy of the post-war United States. And part of their agenda had to do with the rural community. They wanted cheap labor in factories and especially in areas where they needed um, skilled labor, people to train to be in uh, manufacturing. And they, they were concerned about so many boys coming back from World War II and going back to the farm and being farmers. Now remember at this time, 6.8 million Americans were living in rural areas and most of those people lived on farms. These men also had a political agenda, it turns out. It was not just cheap labor, although cheap labor was certainly an important part of it. These were the um, business leaders of the day and they knew their history. They knew that rural populations in the U.S., farmers, had been the vanguard of the populist movement since after, world, or, uh, since after the Civil War. At that time, farmers were fighting banks and the railroads and all of the economic interests that didn't allow them to make a, to make a living. And these farmers had joined with other social movements, like labor, they had elected candidates. They had become very, very politically powerful. And so these uh, leaders of the Committee for Economic Development 
were concerned about what would happen when these men came back to their communities that were now um, enjoying a very high standard of living compared to 10 or 15 years before, that were sending their children to college, and that were uh, very interested in a, uh, an advanced society with benefits uh, spread throughout the citizens of the country. So they really wanted to get these people out of the rural areas and into more urban areas. And they put together a plan, and they began lobbying. So I'm not suggesting that this is some kind of wild conspiracy. This is simply people of a class who socialize together, who strategize together, whose kids go to the same universities, who belong to the same social clubs, sitting around talking about what kind of world they want and having the wherewithal to begin fighting for it and lobbying for it. So foreign policy didn't change very much in the 1940s. But by the 1950s, the Committee for Economic Development was gaining traction. And the whole idea that farm communities um, should begin training their uh, young men to go into other industries had uh, taken hold. Even the USDA began publishing documents talking about how um, one, uh, one third of farms actually produced most of the food and that uh, we needed farmers to go into more productive work. And that's a quote, productive work. So by the time that the Eisenhower administration came into office, there was an ideologue who became the Secretary of Agriculture named Ezra Benson. He was a uh, um, very uh, influential Mormon who uh, was a farmer, but who, who was actually a professional agriculturist. Um, I think he had a PhD in agriculture, but he also uh, farmed. And he just really hated these farm programs. And he believed that it was socialism and that the US was going to become a communist country and that this was the first step to communism. And his whole agenda fit in very well uh, with the McCarthy era. And so they started red baiting and were able to begin chipping away at some of these programs that were helping farmers make a living on par with the rest of society. So this began uh, a snowball effect. And every farm bill after that began to kind of chip away and to reduce um, the, the programs that made it possible for farmers to make a living. And the intent was to replace labor with chemicals and capital. And this is how our industrialized agricultural system began to be built. So let's uh, fast forward a couple of decades, because we don't have time to go through every decade. But by 1960, the 1960s, the uh, um, CED had written a very uh, influential report called an Adaptive Program for agriculture. And this um, program was basically about stopping the training in rural areas, um, training of men in, in high school, men and boys in high school for agriculture, and start directing them towards other careers, making it possible uh, for them to get loans and to move from rural areas. It laid out this whole program for uh, moving uh, young people out of uh, farming areas. And it also had a vision for a food system that would depend on imports, that would, it was beginning to promote the globalized food system. The CED followed that report two years later with another report on a better world through free trade. And it laid out the agenda for a globalized food system and for most of the trade rules that we see today that came about with the World Trade Organization and a lot of these bilateral trade agreements. It was all about efficiency and going to where labor is the cheapest, the US should grow grains, 
places like Mexico should grow fruits and vegetables where, where labor is, is cheap. But all of the investment rules that we've seen in some of these trade agreements, this was first envisioned by this Committee for Economic Development. So they kept lobbying through the uh, 60s and into the 70s, lobbying for the trade agreements, uh, lobbying uh, the Reagan administration for some of the deregulation. So by the mid-1990s, after the U.S. joined the World Trade Organization, there was pressure to get rid of the rest of the, the programs, the vestiges of the programs that had benefited farmers and allowed them to make a living, programs like the Grain Reserve and the Set-Aside Program. This was during the Clinton administration. It was just after the, world, the U.S. joined the World Trade Organization, just after NAFTA, and a lot of promises were made about how terrific this would be for the food system, how great it would be for farmers. The bill was called Freedom to Farm. And it was very uh, shortly after that that farmers renamed it Freedom to Fail because especially for the commodity farmers, they felt the pain before the fruit and vegetable farmers. Two years after uh, the, the bill became law, that would be 1998, the price of corn had plummeted 50%. The price of soy had gone down 35%. There were farms going out of business. Uh, there were wild fluctuations, but mostly the food processors, the grain traders, they were getting their heart's desire, cheap commodities. So there was a lot of political pressure on members of Congress. Some of you, I'm sure, can remember this era and some of these debates going on. So rather than doing something that would make sense, like reinstating some of these programs that kept prices from fluctuating. Congress did what it does best. It spent uh, taxpayer money as an emergency payment to farmers so that they could actually stay in business, but the, the price of uh, commodities like corn and soy would be uh, low, and that meant that there would be uh, these companies that would really benefit. By 2002, the, these payments had become permanent, and the subsidy system was born. So this is uh, the subsidy system that's now about 17 years old. Now, obviously, our food system was broken before the subsidy system, but today, uh, farmers are still not making a living even with the subsidy system. So I want to show you a slide. Um, who do you think benefited the most from this subsidy system? Well, the soft drink uh, industry uh, saved about a billion dollars that first seven years in buying cheap corn. Probably nobody benefited as much, though, as the uh, factory farm. So as you can see here, uh, the, this is hogs. And in 1992, there were only uh, the industrialized, these horrible um, hog factories that mostly Smithfield runs today. Uh, there were only 30% in 92. By 2007, 95% of the hogs eaten in this country were produced on factory farms. And this is because of the cheap corn and soy. It's not the subsidy that really gave them uh, the money. It's that the price of corn and soy was so low that they could buy this feed much cheaper than they ever could before. And so it, it was one of the, the, the uh, main drivers of um, factory farms. So who else benefits from this kind of food system? So I want to ask you all, we need some audience participation. So I'm going to ask um, everybody to stand for a minute. And I'm going to ask you to be honest. I would be sitting too. I'm going to ask everybody to sit who's eaten one of these foods. And I know that I would be sitting. So sit down if you've had a Pepsi, a Gatorade, a Tropicana, 
Lipton Tea, Sierra Mist, Muggs Root Beer, Amp Energy, So No Ever, <laughs> Ever. Not today. I'm not the food police. <laughs> so be drinks, naked juice, Captain Crunch, Quaker cereal, Aunt Jemima's pancakes, puffed wheat, rice aroni, Lay's potato chips, sun chips, Cheetos, Tostitos, Cracker Jacks, Hickory sticks, Doritos, Ruffles, I could go on. Those are all Pepsi products. And uh, Pepsi is the very largest food company in the US, if you want to call that a food uh, company. Most of those uh, items don't um, fit the definition of food in my book. Uh, Nestle is the second largest company, but the largest company in the world and Pepsi is the second largest company in the world. These are some of the companies that really benefit from this, these cheap commodities and who have grown more uh, powerful and richer because of this system. So there are about 20 companies that control the food system. These are companies like Kraft, like a Tyson, JBS, another giant meat company we're going to talk about in a minute, General Mills, uh, ConAgra, Cargill. And these companies are very, very rich and powerful. And so when you go into a grocery store, you think that there are many, many brands, but really there are 20 food companies that control 60% uh, of the brands in the grocery store. And when you look at the relationships and the corporate interlock, uh, there's a lot of uh, many, many relationships. And I looked at the financial industry and the relationships. These companies share uh, 436 different board members. So the point is that over the last 20 or 30 years, these companies have become exceedingly powerful. They've become so powerful that they're able to actually dictate food and farm policy. And I mean, let's think about processed food. Uh, the American diet is comprised mostly of processed food. In fact, 90% of Americans' food dollars are spent on processed food, 90%. If we wonder why people are getting sick and overweight, uh, that's largely uh, why. And uh, these companies also control most of the laws um, around the things that we're exposed to, whether it's pesticides or other chemicals labeling laws. They're just extremely powerful. So this kind of consolidation is um, really detrimental to our food system. And we see this kind of consolidation uh, from top to bottom. So, Let's look at a few other slides and uh, the meat industry. So when you look at the beef industry, you know, we were talking about why farmers can't make a living. One of the problems is that independent farmers, uh, those that grow the, uh, the calves, most, most cattle begin as calves grown by independent farmers in the Midwest, and they live on these uh, calf operations until they uh, gain enough weight and then the meat packer buys them. Sometimes there's a step in between, but then most of these calves end up going to uh, feedlots. So these independent farmers who once were able to sell their cattle at, a, at an auction or some, there, was, there were independent meat packers that would actually buy the cattle. That's all gone today. It's controlled uh, largely by Cargill, Tyson, uh, especially Cargill and Tyson, but also uh, JBS and the national beef is the, uh, uh, the smaller of the four. Um, the same is true in um, pork, and we've already looked at how much pork is controlled by uh, uh, Smithfield or the, the factory farms. Now you'll notice that Tyson and JBS are also in pork. 
They are uh, also in poultry. And the poultry industry is one of the most abusive industries to its workers. And again, you can see that JBS and Tyson are dominant. So JBS is the largest meat company in the world. Tyson is the second largest meat company in the world. Tyson is the largest meat company in the US, and JBS is the second largest. And JBS is a Brazilian company. And in fact, it's in the process of now buying one of the largest meat packers in Canada. So this consolidation is just continuing to grow. So I want to talk a little bit about the poultry industry tonight, because um, unless you don't have the poultry industry in Washington state, I don't believe in this um, area of the country. And what happens with these? Uh, Well, there may be a few, but there probably are a few, but mostly the industry is in Arkansas, North Carolina, uh, the eastern shore of Virginia and Maryland, a little bit in California, probably a little bit here. It's probably, it's probably mostly uh, um, advertising. But anyway, the poultry industry is extremely an abusive industry to its birds and to the workers. So this is, um, this is a diagram of how the uh, industry works. So the meat company owns the genetics of the bird. It owns the bird, so it actually raises the chicks and they're delivered to the contract grower at a, a day or two. It supplies the feed. The feed is usually delivered in three lots, um, starter, grower and detox. So the detox is to clean all of the antibiotics and chemicals in the grower that uh, the chicken eats. These chickens live uh, for less than 45 days. So a, a broiler is about 45 days old. Uh, the company owns um, the patent on its particular blend of antibiotics and chemicals that are in the feed. It owns the trucks that go and pick up uh, the birds, and it, it hires uh, low-income individuals who are the catchers. The catchers are, this is a uh, profession that you see in places like the Eastern Shore of Virginia and Maryland. This is a terrible job. The, uh, these workers go into these big warehouses, and these warehouses have three, 100,000 to 500,000 chickens. Each chicken has less than a square foot of space. And they, they go in and they grab them by their feet and then cram them into these uh, cages. Now, the contract growers, a few of them are beginning to speak out, and I had the opportunity to go inside of one of these warehouses. Usually you can't get near these uh, poultry uh, operations. But there's a woman who's speaking out. Uh, her name is Valerie Ruddle. I interview her in the book. And I, it is, I mean, I just can't even explain how awful it is. I don't know how people go in and, and do the work, much less the birds. And the birds are really scrawny, and um, they're, they uh, peck at each other's feathers. And uh, I could never eat chicken ever again after being in that facility. And then they send them to the slaughter facility. And one of the things these companies are doing is they're lobbying to reduce the inspection at companies. So beginning in the Clinton administration, they began deregulating meat inspection. So it was deregulated in the processing end. Now they're trying to deregulate it in slaughter. And what that means is basically they want the unionized meat inspectors off the line. They want the companies to self-inspect. And now there's uh, a pilot project that they are trying to introduce that uh, will speed up the slaughter lines, and they're already very fast, but this would be 200 birds per minute. Yes, 200 birds per minute. I mean, you get whizzing by, and there's, um, there's no way that you know, a bird can be inspected. And the way that they're uh, maintaining the safety, meat safety, is through chemical washes, things like trisodium phosphate and chlorine. And ever since the Carter administration, 
uh, the industry has been able to soak chicken in water. This, the beef industry fights with the chicken industry because the beef industry doesn't get to soak its meat. So that means that when you buy a chicken, some of the pounds or some of the weight is from the chemical washes, uh, mostly chlorine. So um, anyway, that's the, the big meat side of production. Now let's talk about the growers. Now, when most people think of the growers, they don't have a lot of sympathy because these people are cooperating uh, with the uh, meat companies. But, you know, when you really talk to these people and learn about the situations that put some of the most uneducated and desperate people in the country into this position, you have to have a lot of sympathy. And a lot of times, it's a last-ditch effort to save the family farm and they are given a whole dog and pony show about how they're going to make money and how great it's going to be. And what's really bad is that the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually has guaranteed the loans because these are people who could never get a loan without uh, some kind of guarantee or often they wouldn't be able to. So the grower actually has to take on all the debt from these facilities. The owner is actually running uh, the business, but they're like a renting the property of this grower. These growers are more like chicken sitters than actually uh, uh, farmers. In fact, a lot of them call them, a lot of them call themselves uh, chicken sitters or serfs. I've now heard many uh, contract laborers in the poultry industry begin to call themselves serfs. So they own the debt. They own the barns. They put in a lot of the labor of removing the dead chickens, removing the, all of the uh, manure. They pay the cost to the utilities, and they're left with all of the dead birds and all of the waste and all of the risk because this is a uh, very polluting kind of industry, and so people are often sued because of the environmental damages. This company doesn't... Uh, it doesn't it's not responsible for any of the waste that's generated by its operation. And Food and Water Watch has been involved in uh, uh, lawsuits related to this. So anyway, these uh, growers are kept in the servitude because the uh, Tyson or JBS keeps requiring them to upgrade their facility. So they'll have $300,000, $400,000 of debt. These are people you know, who are making now fif about $15,000 a year. They can't pay off their loan. They are stuck in the chicken business for their entire lives, and a lot of them actually end up losing the businesses because they get to a certain point, and they just can't take it anymore, and so they lose their farms. So this is the kind of injustice that we see um, all through our food system, whether it's the uh, immigrant workers here in... Um, here in the orchards or um, in the fields of the Central Valley. It's, it's based on a very unjust system. And who gets the profit? Let's look at the chicken industry. So when I wrote Foodopoly, I called around, and in Manhattan, a 12-piece bucket of chicken was going for $19.09. The grower gets $0.25. Cents, um, JBS or Tyson gets three to five dollars, and the remainder goes to KFC. And this is how our uh, food system is basically organized. So um, it's not just these giant food processors either. It is also the retail industry. So the retail industry is actually driving the consolidation that we see all through our food system, with Walmart being at the top. Now, this says 50% of all grocery sales. That's an average number. In many markets in this country, one or two of these companies will have 70 to 90% of the market. They basically control the market in groceries. And when you have that kind of consolidation and you need that kind of volume, it really impacts the whole food system. So let's talk about Walmart. We all like to talk about Walmart. I'm really furious because Walmart has just built a store four miles 
from where my farm is. I mean, it's just, it's so, so disgusting. Uh, so one out of three grocery dollars ends up in Walmart's pockets. And to just give you an idea of how vast their wealth is, their heirs have more wealth than the bottom 40% of Americans. That shows you how much economic and political power this company has. And Walmart really stands alone. It's not just their, their size and their market power. It's the way they control the whole food processing industry uh, because of their requirements for uh, their logistics. So if you are a Pepsi or a, a Nestle or a Tyson, even you must bow to the requirements of Walmart because Walmart is such a big part of your business. So Walmart is really the most powerful food company in the country. They control these processors through their requirements for their logistics. They, the company, the processor has to use their IT system, um, their packaging requirements, um, contracts are non-negotiable. Everything about Walmart is about sucking all of the profit all the way from the farm to the Walmart store, and they're very, very successful at it. I think one of the biggest mythologies is that somehow Walmart is going to magically re-regionalize the food system, which we have heard some advocates say. I think it's very naive. Walmart needs volume. They, for instance, buy over a billion pounds of beef every year. When I went to visit the Central Valley of California to try to understand how the fruit and vegetable industry is operating, Walmart has had a just a detrimental effect on even the largest um, fruit and vegetable farms. The, the consolidation of the packers and shippers has been driven by Walmart and, and because of the global trade agreements. But because such volume is required, you can't make it as a traditional shipper and packer from the old days. And you know how this works. The, um, the orchardist grows a crop, uh, maybe it's um, nectarines, and they need someone to uh, to package them and to market them and then to make a deal to distribute them. And so these packers and shippers have gotten larger and larger. And anywhere that you look in the country, you'll see that uh, they have usually a uh, international operation as well. Either they own a, 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 some a division that produces fruits and vegetables somewhere else in the uh, world, or they have a contract. And part of this are the requirements of, um, of the grocery industry. So it's not just Walmart, though. It's uh, when you look at organics, many people feel, well, you know, we're going to grow ourselves out of this from the bottom up. And with the organics industry growing and with even uh, Walmart um, buying organics, surely things are on the mend. But the problem with these uh, large companies uh, and Walmart is, and all of the food processors that are into organics, is that they're in it to make money. They're in it as a niche market. They, they don't support the, the, um, the values underneath organics. And they have been busily, over the last decade, trying to weaken the integrity of the organic label by allowing synthetics into organics, by allowing antibiotics to be used in fruit production, by allowing uh, chemicals in infant food. There are lots of ways that the, the uh, organics um, standard has been weakened a bit. And I think that's one of the things that we all need to do is be involved in making sure that the organic standards board uh, actually lives up to uh, what it's supposed to do and protects the organic standard. But these companies that are just in it because they view organic food as a niche market, a niche market for wealthy, educated people who will pay more. Um, I mean, this is not the long-term vision that we had uh, for organics. 
So let's look at who uh, controls the organics industry, who uh, owns the brands. These are the, uh, um, the largest organic food processing companies. So you probably recognize a lot of these brands. But unfortunately, the conventional food industry actually controls a lot of the organics industry. So this is uh, basically the little green number at the top is the total fo food sales in billions. And then the number on the left is their rank in the top 20 food companies. And uh, then you can see the years that these brands were acquired. What this means is that the top 20 food companies that I talked about, the top largest um, food processors, of those, 14 of them own the most prominent organics brands, the, the brands that you'll see where you, when you go into the, um, the food market. And this is one of the, one of the issues uh, around the integrity of organics. And one of the things that I think that we have to think about in why it's important that we start raising these issues around antitrust, because what kind of food system do we want in the, in the future? And what do we see the role of organics being in the future? So I want to talk a little bit now about the, the big retail markets in organics. And there's really only one. And that's Whole Foods. Now, I know here in Seattle that you have, um, you have more choice. You have other places to shop. But in most places in the country, with any size population, organics, um, Whole Foods dominates the organics industry. Whole Foods has absorbed all of its competitors and, in fact, now is changing its policies in its stores so that it's selling more and more conventional foods as a way to become more profitable. And they're using uh, um, tricks like uh, they have the uh, five-tier program, the GAP program for their meat products, but the nonprofit, the GAP nonprofit, is actually funded by Whole Foods, and the five-tier system most of the stores sell meat at the lower tiers, and there's a very low entry point to get into this system that allows feedlots, allows animals to be transported for more than 24 hours to slaughter. I'm just using it as an example of um, how Whole Foods is not quite being honest in how it does its business. And the other least transparent part of the organics business, and you may be more aware of it here because of the strike going on with United Natural Foods, Inc. Uh, how many people have been following that? In, um, some people have. So United Natural Foods, Inc. is the largest distributor of organic and natural food in the country. And it just dominates the market now. And this means that in many, many areas of the country where there were distributors that sold, uh, helped distribute organic products to buying clubs, small natural foods markets, and uh, small restaurants, that they no longer have a supplier because um, not only is UNFI very expensive, they've just stopped distributing to many of these smaller natural food stores. When I was doing a book signing in West Virginia a couple of weeks ago, there was a organic deli that had, very small deli that had prepared some treats for the bookstore. And I was chatting with the fellow who owns it and he told me that over the last year, UNFI's products have increased in um, price 7%. So I started looking at some of the statistics, and it looks like since UNFI has gone public, they have, uh, in the last five years, uh, their net sales have increased 56%, and their net profit margin has gone up 88%. So um, that's, that's a pretty big increase, and I think that this lack of transparency 
is one of the problems with the organic food industry is most people don't realize that there's this very powerful middleman uh, between the farmer between uh, and the retail store and that that's one of the reasons that we really need to start raising these uh, bigger issues. So I didn't write Foodopoly to just be a downer uh, for all of these uh, uh, dreadful things, but to really look back and look at what needs to change. And I think we need to look to what the Reagan administration did to antitrust law. And some of you are too young to uh, remember this uh, era, and others of you are not. But when the Reagan administration came into office, they were um, Reagan was swept into office with this deregulatory agenda and also getting rid of antitrust law because there were many, many companies that wanted to be able to grow larger and larger because they saw that as an avenue to increasing the, the uh, value of their stock and of their business. And so there had been for uh, at least a, a decade and a half a, a lot of pressure from the grocery manufacturers of America and a lot of other trade associations to start weakening antitrust law. Those are the laws that see if companies are having uh, uh, engaging in non-competitive behavior. So when the Reagan administration came to office, uh, they had, of course, appointees to all of the federal agencies. And at the Federal Trade Commission, uh, there was a lot of bloodshed. So in writing Foodopoly, I had the opportunity to interview uh, the head commissioner of that time, Michael Perchuk, and to ask him about what happened when uh, the new administrator for the Federal Trade Commission came into, uh, came into office. And he said that he and a Republican colleague wrote a 400-page scathing report to Congress about what happened. Uh, they came in, cut the budget dramatically, got rid of whole departments, allowed practices that were against the law before Reagan to take place, like allowing competitors to merge. And then they narrowed the definition of what anti-competitive behavior actually is. And no president since that time has been brave enough to tackle these issues and to try to begin reinstating antitrust law. And Congress is certainly not raising these issues. Now, when President Obama was campaigning for office the first time, he promised farmers in the Midwest to investigate the consolidation and lack of competition in the livestock market. And he actually instituted um, a, uh, a process for doing this. There were hearings over the course of a year. Uh, we were all very hopeful about where this was going to lead. But the meat industry started running ads, and every place that Secretary Vilsack would go, uh, there would be an ad about how uh, this was going to cost jobs, looking at uh, changing the uh, rules so that there would be a more competitive marketplace. So of course, the Obama administration chickened out and didn't do anything. So we want to start putting more pressure to, uh, to start looking at these important issues. And that's really why I wrote Foodopoly. I, you know, I think as someone who benefits from the local food movement, I think it's terrific. It's wonderful for everyone who participates in it. Uh, it's great to go out and visit the farm. It's great when a city like Seattle um, tries to figure out how to do food hubs and to support uh, local food. But if we really want to change the fundamental problems in the food system, we're going to need to do more. And people are going to have to vote with their fork, as many people are doing for their own good health and to support local agriculture. But we need people to vote with their vote and then to hold these elected people accountable. And that needs to begin on a lot of different levels and across the country. And what I'm hoping to do, especially here on the West Coast, where a lot of the thought leaders of the local and the good food movement are located, is to make the case for adding these structural problems to the good food agenda. 
we should be talking about antitrust law and competition. We live in a country that's supposed to be, our economic system is supposed to be built on competition. So why does all federal policy direct um, everything towards consolidation and concentration? These are the kinds of questions we need to start asking. And I think there are a lot of things that can be done. I'm very excited about the uh, GE labeling initiative here in Washington State. Let's hope Washington State has the first labeling law in the country that's going to help uh, curtail the economic power of Monsanto. I think it's going to be a long, hard battle, but it's something that can engage people, and it's one of the important issues today. And I'm really pleased that uh, across the country there are about 15 states that are introducing um, legislation to require the labeling of genetically engineered food. Now, of course, those bills probably aren't going to pass this year, but, you know, this is a step in the organizing that has to happen to make these things uh, happen in the future. Maybe it'll take three to five years, but if enough states do this, we'll be able to get a federal uh, labeling law. These are the steps that people can get involved in at the local level and start building the political power to make the bigger changes. Because we have a tremendous history of organizing in this country, organizing for social change, and we have to have the long view. Uh, you know, look at some of the big fights. It took 50 years to outlaw child labor. Look at how long it took for African Americans to get the vote or for women. It's only those vested economic interests, those multinational corporations that want us to be uh, apathetic and to think there's nothing that can be done and the problem is too big. So I'm excited about all of the young people organizing, about all of the energy, and this is about winning back our democracy. I don't really think we'll fix our dysfunctional food system unless we start fixing our democracy. And we have to fix our democracy. I think that getting food activists involved in the larger uh, political debate, getting rid of Citizens United, um, doing some of the things that need to be done around corporate personhood, all of these things work together. And we have to take hope. And we have to look at the big picture. It's a, uh, uh, a long road out there, but I know if we work collectively together, that the people united will not be defeated. Thank you.